This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Uh, our scripture is from Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. And Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in the east until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. And what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. And then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. I know that the secular celebration of Christmas feels long over, like those shepherds have been like back in the fields for a while, and the shine of the angels now has the like patina of time in their memory. Jesus is no longer in the manger wrapped in swaddling claws, but like a toddler running around with opinions and tantrums. This is all about my son, right? Like divine proportion. Uh, you may have taken down your tree and lights as much as two weeks ago. If you were proper, you took them down like yesterday. Um, some of you might have said it earlier. But here we are still reflecting on the story of the birth of Christ. Because even as the world wants to move on to think that, oh, that was just a nice story about a baby and some angels and an animal feeding trough, we know that it's much more. And so we turn now to the other telling of the story. In the season of Advent and Christmas, we focus a lot on the version of Christmas as it's told in Luke, because, like, let's be honest, Luke is just like the better storyteller of the whole bunch. Like, he's just better at narrative than the rest of them. Um, he has the best character development. He has the best scene setting. He has musical numbers, like, interspersed throughout. So it's, like, fun to read Luke. 
But today we turn to Matthew's version of Christmas, the one that gets overlooked, not only because Luke is better, but because this version is far harder to make cute with kids dressed up. In many ways, this is the NSFW version. While well, Luke tells us the story of a God who became incarnate among the lowest of society as good news, Matthew tells us what happens on the flip side of the coin what those at the top of society thought about that good news and how they reacted. Here we have the story of Herod, a governor of Judea, selected by the Roman Empire to keep the peace. Right? Pax Romana was the, the theme of the Roman Empire. In an area where rebellion was constantly bubbling just under the surface, Herod's one job, the one job he had, was to maintain the power of the empire and the emperor, who was known as the son of God. If Herod couldn't do that, if somehow things got out of hand under Herod's watch, then not only would Rome find someone who could keep that Pax Romana, but it would show its might by brutally punishing the one who couldn't. So while many portrayals of Herod in popular Christian culture portray him as like some sort of bloodthirsty king, I think he was really more of a sniveling middle manager, terrified of the empire he served. So when a bunch of foreign people, no, the text does not name the number or gender of the Zoroastrian astrologers who came, they show up and say that they're has been a cosmic astrological shift in the heavens to proclaim the birth of a new son of God. It's no wonder this frightens the shit out of the air. He is frightened and all of Jerusalem feels the ripple of that fear because we all feel the ripples of the fears of our leaders. In the promise of a Messiah, he not only hears for his own power, but that the whole imperial system that he has hitched his wagon to might come crumbling down. He cannot allow the good news of great joy for all people to come to fruition at the expense of the power he himself has gained from Rome. So he tries to get the Magi on his side. And like, honestly, they're a little naive, right? <laughs> Why go to Herod in the first place? I don't know. But like he tries to get it on his side. He puts on this false mask of deference and homage. But I think in that interaction, the Magi somehow know better, even without the help of angels. Those who have felt the ripples of what empire can do, who exist on the margins, who are from a, another area of the world where constantly there is empires trying to overtake empires. They can pretty easily recognize those who are clinging to the center of power with all their might. So these magi do continue to follow the star to the Christ child, and then they go home by another way, subverting Herod's plan. Which leads to even more fear on Herod's part, which morphs into anger like it does so easily, which then paired with the little power he has transformed into violence against those who are innocent. The children of Judea pay the ultimate price because the Pax Romana remains the highest priority. Like Pharaoh, before him, Herod, and by extension Caesar, wipe out an entire generation of children on the mere threat that their power will not be eternal. And while I wish I could say that this was the last time in history that fear and anger and power have conspired against the innocent, we know that that's not true. We see it every day. We know it's a pattern that continues on scales big and small, even in our world. So what does Christmas teach us? about to do when we encounter that pattern. Dr. Esau McCauley wrote a New York Times opinion piece last week. Luke sent it to me knowing this was the text for this week. And I was like, oh, okay, we're so hip. We're in the New York Times. Um, 
It's titled The Bloody Fourth Day of Christmas because the, the Feast of the Innocents is celebrated on that fourth day. <clears throat> and Dr. McCauley reflects on why it's so important that this story gets remembered in the Christmas season. He says, this story calls Christians and others to remember that we live in a world in which political leaders are willing to sacrifice the lives of the innocent on the altar of power. We are forced to recall that this is a world with families on the run, where the weeping of mothers is often not enough to win mercy for their children. More than anything, the story of the innocent calls upon us to consider the moral cost of the perpetual battle for power in which the poor tend to have the highest casualty rate. Christmas should be a time where we, those who follow Christ, recalibrate ourselves and our priorities. We should take stock of how we are challenging those with power and protecting as best we can those who are innocent and oppressed. We should remember that the story is not just a baby in a manger, but that baby becomes a refugee, fleeing state violence. And countless others cannot flee from the fear and anger of those whose power is threatened. Christmas ends with the day of Epiphany where the Magi finally find the Christ child, yes, but then offer gifts, yes, but also commit to subverting that empire. As soon as they see the Christ child, it becomes clear that they need to go another way. The star that they followed not only led them to the same child of hope and gloria in Excelsis Deo that the shepherds found, but it continued to inspire the ones who follow to continually reassess their priorities and navigate a world filled with deception and obstacles to proclaiming that hope. They did not let Herod have the last word. Later today during communion, you'll come and you'll select your star word, like I said, a practice we've done the last couple of years if you're new to it, you'll see as you come and we gather in our circle over here, there's a table filled with cards with a variety of words on it. Um, or if you're on Zoom, again, I'll get you a link um, that can randomly generate a word for you. Um, like I said, you could either look and pick a word intentionally or like just be really bold and you know not have the amount of control I like in my life, but um, uh, you can randomly pick a word and see what, what happens. The hope is, is that you will keep this word somewhere where you will see it often. So Tim and I keep ours on our bathroom mirror all year long. Um, and then we pray that this word guide you as the star guided the Magi, helping you find God in new places, discovering new ways to proclaim hope where the world wants to proclaim despair, maybe inspire you to speak out against those who are operating out of fear and anger. May this word give you strength to stand with those on the margin and boldness to know when you have given what you can. As we close out this um, intentionally a few days long Christmas celebration and we move into the next part of the calendar, may we continue to hold the whole of Christmas in our heart, including this hard story. To help us with this, I always love to end Christmas with this poem by Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is still, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart.